Alrighty, Acoustic Pants here, and this video is the answer to the last question in a series of questions from Kung Fu Simon, uh, a fellow Redditor, which he posted in the Christianity subreddit. Uh, links to his original question should be in this video by the time you see it. Uh, the fifth question is, the ram and the goat, was that supposed to be Macedonia overpowering Persia? So this is in the book of uh, Daniel in the Old Testament. The short answer is yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, and if you if you read on from from the from the passage, uh, it's it's explained to Daniel. In fact, I may as well just read this particular passage. It's pretty cool. I like the book of Daniel. <gasps> Excuse me. And if you've made it this far through these videos, Kung Fu Simon or whoever else, I do congratulate you. It's an interesting topic, but unfortunately, uh, when we ask these questions of any religious nature, there's no simple answer I can just give in Reddit uh, in one or two sentences. So I make these videos, and I like making these videos, it's a lot of fun. So, it's in the second half of Daniel. And it's tied together, he has a bunch of visions. Yeah, so we'll start with Daniel 8. Or will we? Yes, we will. Daniel 8, verse 1. So during the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, saw another vision, following the one that had already appeared to me. In this vision, I was at the fortress of Susa in the province of Elam, standing beside the Ulai River. So this is in ancient Persia, basically. As I looked up, I saw a ram with two long horns standing beside the river. One horn was longer than the other, even though it had grown later than the other one. The ram butted everything out of his way to the west, to the north, and to the south, and no one could stand against him or help his victims. He did as he pleased, and became very great. While I was watching, suddenly a male goat appeared from the west, crossing the land so swiftly that he didn't even touch the ground. This goat, which had one very large horn between its eyes, headed toward the two-horned ram that I had seen standing beside the river, rushing at him in a rage. <clears throat> The goat charged furiously at the ram and struck him, breaking off both of his horns. Now the ram was helpless, and the goat knocked him down and trampled him. No one could rescue the ram from the goat's power. The ghost became the ghost. The goat became very powerful, but at the height of his power his large horn was broken off. In the large horn's place grew four prominent horns pointing in the four directions of the earth. Then from one of the prominent horns came a small horn whose power grew very great. It extended toward the south and the east and toward the glorious land of Israel. Its power reached to the heavens where it attacked the heavenly army, throwing some of the heavenly beings and some of the stars to the ground and trampling them. It even challenged the commander of heaven's army by cancelling the daily sacrifices offered to him and by destroying his temple. The army of heaven was restrained from responding to this rebellion, so the daily sacrifice was halted and truth was overthrown. The horn succeeded in everything it did. Then I heard two holy ones talking to each other. One of them asked, How long will the events of this vision last? How long will the rebellion that causes desecration stop the daily sacrifices? How long will the temple and heaven's army be trampled on? The other replied, It will take 2300 evenings and mornings, then the temple will be made right again. And then in the rest of the chapter, the angel Gabriel explains the vision to Daniel. So that's a pretty fun thing, you know, rams and goats running around headbutting each other, you know, ruining sacrifices and temples and horns and political power and so on. So yeah, basically you're right. The um, the ram overpowers the goat, or was it the other way around? I just read it. The goat overpowers the ram. Um, in this kind of vision, they're kingdoms. The animals represent kingdoms, so. Um, there's the two horns, uh, the longer one which grew up later is Persia, the shorter horn is Media, or it could be Babylon. So, so the way the history goes, so, um, the Jews, after the time of their kings, the Babylonians came along, uh, and exiled them, and then while they were in exile, the Persians came to power, uh, and then after that, 
the Greeks came to power and then the Romans. So they're the four big empires throughout. Well, I suppose you could count the Assyrian Empire as well. But they're the, the four big empires which um, shape Judeo-Christian history. Uh, so the two horns, um, so animals with horns or heads, heads and horns can refer to different nationalities or individual rulers or kings or groups ruling that particular power or particular nation. So the longer horn is probably Persia and the shorter horn is probably Babylon which came up earlier because Babylon was the earliest empire. It could also be Persia and Media because the em outsiders didn't really distinguish between the two kingdoms of Persia and Media. Um, Media was the northern half of modern day Iran, Persia the southern half right on the Persian Gulf. Oh, but, but either way it's two kingdoms. And then you know, parts of the book of Daniel are written in Aramaic, so I believe this part is in Aramaic, but the rest is written in Hebrew. Um, or maybe the other way around. So, like, the book of Daniel was thought to be written, I think, around 150 BC, from memory. Written in the intertestamental period, you'd say. So, like, 100 to 200 years before Jesus. Uh, <coughs> Hebrew was pretty much out of fashion then. Uh, Isra Israelites spoke uh, Aramaic so Jesus and his disciples they spoke Aramaic and knew a bit of Hebrew uh, and Hebrew was for the educated uh, old uh, old families with you know money and education uh, the author may have written parts of his book in Hebrew and Aramaic so that religious authorities or political authorities couldn't read the Hebrew bits to hide it because some of it is like it's quite politically charged a lot of this a lot of this writing and if if you know your local governor heard that there was some Jew trying to stir up trouble with prophecies that their god would you know restore their land and kick out the Persians or the Greeks or the Romans you know you can't have that so you write it in in a language they're not going to know well that that's the general general consensus from historians and we have a lot of cases in history of, of conquered peoples doing that that kind of thing uh, but his visions Daniel's visions record the rise and fall of different empires so there's got the other one of four beasts um, this should be so chapter 8 is do the horns split large horn was broken off in the horns place grew four prominent horns pointing in the four directions of the earth the goat became very powerful Yeah, so the goat, sorry, the goat is the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great, with the one great horn. And the ram is the Persio Median Empire. And then when the, when the goat's horn breaks off and splits into four, that's his four generals, because Alexander the Great died young and left his empire to his four generals without naming a successor to rule the whole thing. So his four generals got, you know, a quarter of his empire each. The important, the, the important parts for the Jews were the two southern kings kingdoms there was the Ptolemaic kingdom over Egypt and then the Seleucid kingdom which mainly ruled from Syria but Israel was right in the middle of these two and the Ptolemaic kingdom over Egypt was generally sympathetic to the Jews the Seleucid kingdom was generally not um, <clears throat> and it's thought that a lot of the that a lot of this kind of scripture applies to the Seleucid empire because they were the oppressive ones uh, let's see. A small horn oppresses Israel, corrupts the temple and the daily sacrifices. So this is where your abomination comes from, Kung Fu Simon, and, and the king sets up the abomination of desolation in the temple. Uh, which chapter is that in exactly? Actually, I think it's in 8. Yeah, so at the end of the same chapter... Sorry, I'm just read, reading it through. Mm. It's in there. Uh, <clears throat> so the small horn oppresses Israel. Uh, the small horn is referred to be, often thought to be Antiochus IV, because under his rule, um, he tried to attack Egypt. His general, whose name eludes me now, he the general failed had to come back 
um, and came back through Israel and, you know, was just angry. Took his anger at defeat out on the Israelites and, you know, desecrated the temple and so on. Uh, <coughs> oppressed Israel, defaced the temple. Back to your early questions from um, the book of Revelation and the Antichrist, the afterlife, so on. There's a lot of imagery which comes from this book and the Old Testament prophets in general and the whole Old Testament really, like the wife and the dragon and um, the trees and whatnot. So this, this book has a few of them as well and like the beasts and the goats with horns and heads and things. Um, the desecration and, and those kinds of ideas are tied to this book. So to understand Revelation, you want to understand this, this Old Testament stuff as well. Just a, a bit of a side note, really, to reading the Bible in general. Apparently over 200, 251, 250 specific uh, images or themes in the book of Revelation link to the Old Testament. Um, not all details are there, though, to be uh, like pressed for interpretation or to define them. Uh, they're more supportive rather than definitive, meaning what I mean by that is they're not there to be interpreted, like you don't need to exactly figure out who this beast represents or exactly what that number means or exactly when this will happen. A lot of it's more supportive. Um, so you, you leave it un, uninterpreted because the author wasn't trying to give you information on that specific point. Uh, another general thing when reading the book of Revelation. Parts of this book also are very apocalyptic. Uh, and yeah, this, this chapter, chapter 8, would be part of that. The vision of the four beasts. He has a vision of a messenger, kings of the south and the north. That would be... Yeah, like kings of the south and north. That would probably be Seleucid versus Ptolemaic empires. The different numbers of days and times. Michael the Archangel shows up again in chapter 12. That's fun. Um, parts of this book in Daniel and Revelation are very apocalyptic. Like the second half of Daniel, you could say the whole thing is part of this apocalyptic genre, which doesn't exist today, which I mentioned in the first two, second, third, and fourth video. Uh, so there's a theme of the persecution of God's people by political powers of the time. Uh, and generally, the author is trying to encourage them, like, Biblical prophecy is about insight, guidance, correction, and hope. And in fact, the whole Bible is really about hope for God's people, I think, in some way or another. And the author of Daniel is trying to say to God's people, just hold on, because these human oppressors are, are merely counterfeit rulers. Uh, they don't have ultimate say in the end. Satan even does not have the ultimate final say. God alone does. So hold on to your faith in God, and eventually everything will be put right. Even though we suffer now, um, eternally, our status is as God's people and God will put things to right. That's basically where, where the book of Daniel is going. Hope for God's people. And don't cave in to the forces of evil or to people who proclaim themselves as gods or don't worship the emperors or the kings because they're just people like you. You know, that, that whole thing is the thrust of Jewish or Christian apocalyptic literature. Uh, and that's about all I have to say uh, on your questions. I hope I've helped. I'm, I'm sorry I can't give you the kind of answers you were probably expecting. Um, the Bible just doesn't seem to work that way, unfortunately. It's a real pain in the backside like that. But when you do understand, um, you know, authorial intent and earliest interpretations, and when you get these ancient mythologies and how they use the imagery to make their, make their religious spiritual points, well, then the Bible becomes really interesting. It's a really cool book, um, but you have to understand that to understand what God might be saying to us now. You can't just interpret it without without taking the human authors into account, I don't think. But the other thing I wanted to say about Kung Fu Simon in general, and anyone who finds this series of videos interesting, like his questions are, to read them out again, let me have a look at the Reddit post. So like he pulls from a Kung Fu Simon you pull from a lot of different sources you've got how did the dead saints bodies rise in Jerusalem when they're supposed to be in the spirit right assuming you're talking about the crucifixion account and that only happens in Matthew and the second question John was supposedly in the future at Patmos Island saw the dragon with the third of the angels and then he comes to earth again and that's meant to be in the future 
The dead will apparently be in the past. You've got uh, the trumpet call of Michael, the resurrection of the dead. Uh, questions about the afterlife, Enoch, Elijah and Moses. The nature of death, the king of abomination, uh, what's, and, and um, the desecration and the antichrist. Trying to make a timeline out of prophecy, rams and goats. Like these themes are all very prophetic and apocalyptic and I find them very interesting. And I think if you are interested in that kind of stuff, Kung Fu Simon, if you're a Christian, probably means that God has got for you or wants to give you some kind of prophetic insight or some kind of prophetic gift. Or if you find this stuff really interesting, I would imagine God wants to give you the kind of visions that these authors in the Bible had as well. And he wants, he wants to use you to encourage God's people uh, in hard times or in easy times um, prophetically. Um, and I don't know if you've thought of it that way and, and Mr. Country Simon I don't know if you're Christian or not but it doesn't matter like I'm, God loves everyone right uh, or at least we believe he does and, it, and just because you're not a Christian doesn't mean God doesn't want to bless you he does uh, but I think if you find that whole like I find this whole realm of, of scripture and, and theology really fascinating uh, and if you're the same I'm almost certain that means that that's kind of your thing that God wants to do with you in, in your life prophetic visions and dreams and um, those kinds of experiences so yeah if you found these videos at all helpful please subscribe on YouTube the videos are out Wednesday and Sunday and I play them to video games because I like gaming and it's fun and no one does it uh, so yeah I have been Acoustic Pants and I will see you next time Steam Geyser exhausted. From the from the passage uh, it's it's explained to Daniel in fact I may as well just read this particular passage it's pretty cool I like the book of Daniel 
Excuse me. And if you've made it this far through these videos, Kung Fu Simon or whoever else, I do congratulate you. It's an interesting topic, but unfortunately, uh, when we ask these questions of any religious nature, there's no simple answer I can just give in Reddit uh, in one or two sentences. So I make these videos, and I like making these videos, it's a lot of fun. So, it's in the second half of Daniel. And it's, the ram butted everything out of his way to the west, to the north, and to the south, and no one could stand against him or help his victims. He did as he pleased, and became very great. While I was watching, suddenly a male goat appeared from the west, crossing the land so swiftly that he didn't even touch the ground. This goat, which had one very large horn between its eyes, headed toward the two-horned ram that I had seen standing beside the river, rushing at him in a rage. <clears throat> the goat charged furiously at the ram and struck him, breaking off both of his horns. Now the ram was helpless, and the goat knocked him down and trampled him. No one could rescue the ram from the goat's power. The ghost became... <laughs> the ghost. The goat became very powerful, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off. In the large horn's place grew four prominent horns pointing in the four directions of the earth. Then from one of the prominent horns came a small horn whose power grew very great. It extended toward the south and the east and toward the glorious land of Israel. Its power reached to the heavens where it attacked the heavenly army, throwing some of the heavenly beings and some of the stars to the ground and trampling them. It even challenged the commander of heaven's army by cancelling the daily sacrifices offered to him and by destroying his temple. The army of heaven was restrained. Alrighty, Acoustic Pants here, and this video is the answer to the last question in a series of questions from Kung Fu Simon, uh, a fellow Redditor, which he posted in the Christianity subreddit. Uh, links to his original question should be in this video by the time you see it. Uh, the fifth question is, the ram and the goat, was that supposed to be Macedonia overpowering Persia? So this is in the book of uh, Daniel in the Old Testament. The short answer is yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, and if you if you read on from tied together, he has a bunch of visions. Yeah. So we'll start with Daniel 8. Or will we? Yes, we will. Daniel 8, verse 1. So during the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, saw another vision, following the one that had already appeared to me. In this vision, I was at the fortress of Susa in the province of Elam, standing beside the Ulai River. So this is in ancient Persia, basically. As I looked up, I saw a ram with two long horns standing beside the river. One horn was longer than the other, even though it had grown later than the other one. <laughs> 